and we are live now live thank you uh, right good afternoon everybody um thank you for joining us and also um a big thank you to john wheeler um john has kindly offered to talk to us a bit about not only his journey but a bit about the solution focus approach and how it came about uh, which has been a really interesting subject because we've just been kind of reading a lot of the history lately. So I'm really pleased to have you here uh, with us, John. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe, obviously, some people may know you, some may not. So maybe an introduction to yourself, um, you know, um, how you came to this approach. A bit of your background would be good. Okay, so... So my background is working as a social worker, eventually training as a family therapist. Um, and it was whilst working in child and adolescent mental health in Gateshead, uh, 1991. Uh, I saw an advert for a course that kind of looked interesting. It had a kind of quirky title, which I, I now don't remember, but it wasn't solution focused free therapy. Uh, and, and it appealed to me, and I thought that that's something I, I need to try out. Um, I, I think that in itself is unusual for me, really. I, I guess I came into social work in the first place because I hoped I could make a difference in people's lives. And um, and I think I I always assume that if, if I can construct the conversation in a useful way, then, then change would happen. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's an onus on me to get, get good at uh having conversations that could be helpful i think that that's that's the case and so i'd always kind of noticed um articles or books that had titles that offered that sort of promise yeah, so basically uh, we're talking about friday it was the uh, 1991 uh, early days of guys in brief uh doing their training up and down the country in all sorts of facilities the best they could get hold of um as was a chemistry laboratory in Newcastle University, so we had sinks and taps and all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we very quickly forgot, and uh, and uh, I was just absolutely intrigued by the videos I saw. So this is Chris Dyson. Um mm. And I've, I've reflected on that quite a bit in various bits of writing that I've done, and I've, I've talked about it a lot in training. So I've been working in CAMS for a few years. Um, uh, uh, it was a kind of strange experience at the beginning because there was a lot that, that Chris was sharing you know, with the ways of the solution focused assumptions that were counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. uh, they were an exact opposite of actually how I was going about things. Um, so I was kind of yeah, intrigued and puzzled and uh, challenged. Mm -hmm. And I think the two things that made the hugest, hugest difference was. Um, uh, seeing the videos where clearly uh, this way of talking with people was making a difference in people's lives and the exercises where we were finding that, that, that out for each other as well, that all sorts of things were occurring to us as we did exercises. So by the end of the day, you know, despite it being counterintuitive, I think I'd done a kind of 180 degree turn. I was yeah. like, okay, this is how I'm going to be on Monday. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, practicing the questions over the weekend, so making sure I was worth perfect. And <laughs> yeah. So, so were, you, were, you, were you still working as a, a social worker or a family therapist when you went back to work? What was. I was always um, employed as a social worker. And um, mm. so the sort of time scale we're talking about, I was looking at that. Um, uh, I trained as a social worker in 1976, 1978, and um, I think, you know, I'm going to kind of leap onto a quote from Isaac Newton here, you know, if I can see further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, and mm. um, I think solution focused um, ends up being what it is, because uh, there are some good shoulders to stand on, so it didn't mm. come out of nowhere, there were various uh, radical steps. Uh, mm. Uh, created this new field, this new people. The story of solution focused practice is also, I, I, I'd like to think, the story of me that I, I went through various transitions. So mm. I think um, there, are, there are possibilities in my, my thinking as a practitioner that were, I think were already there 
uh, that solution focus just fitted with really well. And I remember thinking at the end of that Friday, this is the thing I've been looking for for years. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've been getting closer and closer, and this is it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that was it, both in terms of the values, uh, the assumptions, the ways of thinking about people, the ways of, of engaging with people, um, and having conversations that can make a difference. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's amazing how many um, practitioners were social workers before, and it's. Oh, yeah. um, I hear that all the time, you know, I used to be a social worker or was in family therapy. Because um, I guess <clears throat> it, it's it's that difficult, um, it's that difficult transition in it. If you're a social worker, you obviously got statutory things that you need to get yeah. put in place, but also yeah. you want to be collaborative. So yeah. how did you juggle that? Good. That's a very good question because um, uh, people came to our service uh, through various routes. Um, a, a common route would be a, a parent or a carer going to a GP concerned about a uh, child or a young person, um, and they would come our way. Um, those were people who, you know, were looking for some sort of help. Uh, they wanted things to be different from the way they were. Um, the youngsters themselves didn't necessarily want to be there. Uh, it wasn't necessarily their idea, but at least someone in the family wanted to be there. Um, and then in our team, we also work with families where there are safeguarding concerns. Uh, so colleagues in uh, safeguarding teams would refer families on. I think it's, I think it's you know, I, 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 and it's pretty clear for me that on that Monday, uh, all, all of a sudden I had a lot of ideas about how to work with the people who want to be there. I had no ideas about how to work with people who don't want to be there. Um, uh, and it really took a while, I think, sort of getting used to this way of talking with people to just sort of gradually edging into that. Um, I think probably quite a helpful kind of uh, turning point for me because I had the benefit of going to lots of workshops by you know, really good presenters, so um, more workshops by brief, uh, workshops by... Uh, other people they brought across a lot of international presenters um i remember bill hanlon once saying uh, um if someone is in a room with you and they're talking then there must be something they want to have different in their life otherwise they wouldn't be there and mm. um, he talked about it as taxi cabbing it, it's like if you can take on the mindset of a taxi driver you know what you're in my cab where do you want to go yeah, yeah. This cab can take you somewhere, uh, and in the reality of being a taxi driver, it, it'd be pretty odd for someone to say, "Well, I don't know, you just take me somewhere." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, you know, we, we get into yeah. taxi because we've got somewhere in mind, and likewise, yeah. um, because at that time, um, I kind of played with it. There's a framework you read about it in the books, you know, customers, visitors, and complainants, um, and in some ways. Helpful, but in some ways it can be unhelpful. If you think about it as terms of relationships, and it gives you room for manoeuvre, but it can only too easily slip into a way of categorising people. And then if you if you think, you know, I haven't got a customer, then you know you, you don't move into uh, a constructive conversation because uh, yeah. Uh, so so that that made a, a critical difference for me. So so for example. Um, uh, uh, one parent came along, uh, she had three children, um, uh, and um, I said, and so, you know, what are your thoughts about being here? She said, oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, and said, so, um, well, tell me a bit about, you know, how you came to be here, what's the social worker you told me how to come, um, and uh, what, what's your thoughts about that? Um, well, uh, I don't know what they're on about. You know, they're, they're all about, you know, my son there, uh, that he should be behaving better, that saying I should be more assertive, and, um, and my partner, that he undermines me, which is none of the business, you know? Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. Um, so you're here, you know, so, you know, we could sort of work on anything you think needs to be different. Is there anything that we could use this time for? And she pointed to one of the boys and said, well, I wish he'd behave himself, and I wish, <laughs> I wish I had a bit more authority. And I don't know, wish he didn't undermine me so much. And then we're off. Yeah. <laughs> so, I wish I had it on video because, you know, if I'd had a permission, I'd still be showing it. So, <laughs> easy as that. It's incredible. But that shift, 
it's just yeah yeah uh, it's yeah somehow or another there was something entirely different about the relationship we then had and i mm. i've often thought in training you know that um that uh, because sometimes when i've uh train the social workers working in safeguarding i'll talk about the difference between a power over relationship and a power with um and uh how is it that uh a service user makes that decision to enter into a power with relationship and, and over time it, it, it occurred to me i think it's got to be something to do with trust uh mm -hmm. that the person decides this person they're going to trust this person they're talking to so somehow or another I think with that particular parent, some sort of trust kept into place, and then we're off. You know? mm. uh, yeah, yeah. And and I guess the fact that you ask her what what would be what she wanted to talk about or what she would find helpful, yeah, kind of gives a bit of respect to the client. Well, it might be as simple as that, mightn't it? And that's mm. like, you know, <laughs> that's such simple stuff. <laughs> it could really be that simple, and maybe it is. Maybe. Mm. So, you know, it's nicely yeah. so you know that stayed with me that fascination and, uh, the team i worked in um we were asked to do um specialist assessments for safeguarding concerns so more and more you know my coloring of that if you like was was the solution focused coloring and uh mm. inviting people's perspectives and engaging people um and i yeah and i was fortunate in being in the team where you know that was not only allowed if you like valued but i, I think sort of colored how, how i think it's just you know we all engage with the families that came our way you know uh, yeah, yeah. And, um, and, uh, I, I guess collaboration if you can get it is always better than being adversarial <laughs> absolutely and you don't know what's going to come from that you don't know you know um into, um I, I was going to say at the beginning you know uh the history of solution focused it's gonna you know i what i i can share is what fascinated me and caught my attention so it's by no means the whole picture we spoke earlier about actually it's a big picture <laughs> mm -hmm. um and there are lots of players it's and i end up talking most about into kim berg and steve DeShazer because they're the ones i i know most about and mm you know before i go and say anything else you know it's, you know it's important to acknowledge we're talking about a whole bunch of people yeah. uh, which is why having good you know a good number of perspectives on this is really really important uh yeah, yeah. uh but yeah and so um yeah so i don't know what i was going to say there but it's, but it's long it's disappeared now <laughs> if you ask yeah. do, you, do you remember the question that you asked um tara's team you may not but i do do you remember the question you asked tara's team if insu was oh yeah, yeah that's right it's in, if, if insu could watch you now <laughs> I might appreciate what she might be pleased to see you doing yeah so payback if oh, she yeah. was watching you now what might she be pleased to see i uh, i think the way I've, I've just carried on with a passion and uh shared the, the approach with yeah thousands and thousands and countless numbers of people over the years uh, mm -hmm. I, I remember the uh, european brief therapy association conference was in dublin uh, many years ago and uh, uh the, those conferences have been really good for uh the likes of myself to share what, what our current passion is and um it occurred to me i had a real passion for sharing this approach with people in frontline services because uh, i was in a specialist service you know, and I was thinking about well, the folks at Gates said how many families get to be seen in a specialist service is a relatively small number. You know? um, mm. but how many families are working on frontline services is a vast number, vast number. You know? So not you know we, we mentioned social workers before, but health visitors, you know, mm. teachers, uh, the whole you know youth workers, community workers, the whole pile of people, uh, mm. community police officers, the whole pile of people uh, that the public engage with um mm -hmm. and and if they could get to know about this particular way of engaging with people collaborating with people then you know way 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 more people will get the benefit of that uh, mm -hmm. yeah so I, I think i think Vince would be impressed <laughs> with that, that sort yeah. of uh, enthusiasm to sort of go wherever and, and talk about this approach you know and encourage people to consider it and try it out you know 
Yeah, and and um, taking it out of the traditional field of therapy, I guess, bringing it to a wider, like you say, people have conversations all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so um, you're spreading the message out of that sort of field into the community. Yeah, I, I mean, and I just have an absolute pile of anecdotes, really, you know, both from people's and then, you know, Sorry, John. Of, Sorry, John, yeah. can you just repeat that? Because we lost you for a second. Okay, yeah, I, I just have a whole pile of anecdotes, really, you know, that, that have stayed with me and, I, you know, and they pop into my head. Um, we were very fortunate at, in Gateshead back in 2004 uh, to be chosen as a pilot for um, the Every Child Matters initiative. So like, you know, uh, CAF, you know, yeah. uh, all those things, you know. Um, and, it, and it gave me and Viv Hogg a wonderful opportunity uh, to train loads of people uh, in Gateshead practitioners and uh, West End and Newcastle. Uh, so we're, we're a wonderful platform to do that. And, uh, and we would meet people for a follow up. And, and sometimes it's the simplest of things that made made the biggest difference. So I remember a health visitor uh, coming back to a follow up day and saying, uh, you know, there's, there's one, one, one question you, you introduced me to that I, I ask every single parent now. Uh, and it's just absolutely transformed uh, uh, my, my, my engagements with them. And, and I said, oh, what's that? And, and she said, uh, uh, what are you thinking of doing about that? <laughs> he said, up to that point, as a health physician, in mind, I see large number, a typical clinic, I'm seeing loads of parents, you know, every day. Uh, so, first one, there's a problem, I don't know what to do, but I think you should do such and such. Another one, relationship problem with partner, well, I think you should do such and such. Another one, with the child. So, I'm problem solving it, you know, minute after minute, you know. Um, and after coming across this solution focused approach, it doesn't matter. Uh, what, what people raise a sense of, hmm, what are you think they're doing about that? The housing one, well, I'm thinking they're going to the housing office and I would, oh, okay, you know, what time would you go? I well, would probably go after here, you know. <laughs> Everyone had ideas. Everyone had ideas. <laughs> yeah. Uh, complete, uh, yeah, and you know, it's, um, <clears throat> it's um, have, having, um, you need to have that belief that the client knows how to solve a problem um, and and um, like you say what what do you think you're going to do about that rather than trying to jump in and save everyone all the time quiet, quiet, yeah. seeing what they come up with so in terms of the history John because I, I like I said I've, I'm doing your course at the moment and that <laughs> was that was a really um, it was really interesting it was really interesting to go back and look at the history because um, Although, um, like Aisha was saying, one of these, like going back to your taxi driver scenario, you don't get in a cab and I'm tell him where you've been. You tell him where you want to go. Um, so it was, it's, it's, we don't need to know the history, but I found it really, really interesting. But also I think it's a, a good way when someone wants you to explain how you're going to work with them. Because some people are interested about that. So, um, Give us a history of the solution focus approach. When did it go from problem to solution? Well, I, we're not talking about exact dates. It's very much a work in progress, and I think mm. there are kind of hints and possibilities. Uh, and if you like, kind of waves, I think, of, of um, radical movements, perhaps initially in the world of therapy, you know, that opened up the possibility that eventually became solution focused. So, I, I, and um, I did a bit of a, a timeline here because. Um, if we look at some data, so the early 1970s, we've got Insu Kimberg uh, and other social workers uh, working in the family service in Milwaukee. Um, now, Insu, uh, she did some uh, workshops for us uh, in the Northeast in uh, 1999. Yeah. And I think, that for me, there's something about INSU, I think, that was already kind of on the way. Um, so INSU trained, uh, she, she talked to us about her training as a social worker, okay? Um, and the model she was taught at the time was psychodynamic, uh, which, curiously enough, so was I, you know, as a social worker. And one of the things she had to do was keep the family in treatment for a year. 
right. keep a family in because it's a test of your, when you're using that approach that's something you have to be good at doing you know and um she just couldn't do it. <laughs> she couldn't keep people in treatment for a year because they, they just can't get in there. <laughs> it's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> so clearly there's something about him through already. And, you know, forgive me if I start off on all sorts of tangents. No, go on. But, I, uh, but I've also wondered if there's something about Insu not being native to America. As you, you'll know, she came from Korea. Um, and uh, she, told, she told us about just how tough it was uh, as, as a Korean, trying to make sense of why American families went about things the way they did. Because uh, it didn't make any sense to her. She said, for example, um, she would say to a parent, so when your children misbehave, what do you do? Uh, and they say, well, we ground them. And she'd say, ground them? What on earth does that mean? Uh, and I remember her say, oh, well, we, we keep them in. And she said, well, that's strange. In Korea, we throw them out. <laughs> <laughs> and then she would say, so how does that work? And often parents would say, well, it doesn't really. <laughs> <laughs> so this a natural position of not knowing. And um, I, I mentioned the European Brief Therapy Association. One of the conferences is a plenary. And it provo- one of the interesting things about uh, folks in continental Europe uh, compared to me, they're so much better at speaking more than one language. Now, I remember one guy was saying um, he has much better outcomes when he's not in his native language. Mm. Now, isn't that weird? Yeah, yeah. It isn't weird because it's, he's in a position of not, not knowing much and people need to explain to him. They have to teach him and explain things and give more detail. Which is we all know from solution focused practice practices exactly what you need to be doing to be a, a helpful practitioner, you know, inviting people to give their own explanations, go into detail, you know. So I wonder if that's happening with with, with um uh, with Insu. And I have a slight resonance with that in that um, I was born in Wiltshire, you know, so as you all know in the south of England, um, uh, all my professional practices have been in the northeast. A really quite a different culture and actually quite a lot of different words for them. Mm. Uh, so I had something with that challenge of needing to learn and understand and knowing there were cultural differences and I couldn't take things for granted that I actually knew what was going on uh, and needed people to tell me. So there's something about Insu there. And um, the other thing I want to sort of flag up is that um, uh, once Insu was working there and later on Steve DeShazer joins it, they're making great use of family therapy. Now, uh, I my first training, I was looking at some dates here. My first training in family therapy was 1988. But actually, my first class of family therapy was my last year of training as a social worker in 1977. And uh, in our course, uh, we had an option in the second year of social workers, which was called um, working with individuals and families. Um, it turned out that uh, the tutor was uh, Ruth Ray, who I subsequently now know was uh, uh, one of the founding members of the Association for Family Therapy. Um, so she starts off the module by saying, we're not going to cover anything about individuals. We're going to do family therapy. <laughs> uh, I remember that the social workers, this is certainly my sense, that there's so much about working with individuals that carry the danger of labelling and locating the problem in the person. And the family therapy at that time had, had a great promise, it seemed to me, of uh, understanding people within the context of their lives. And, and that, that really, really kind of, you know, st- sat with me and so it made so much sense that um you know coming back to working in cams i would i would work quite often with young people um who were referred for anger management quite specifically that you know um now you talk about the details about you know when um things happen you might have a i don't know a youngster who's in school and he's, he's thrown, thrown a chair you know mm-hmm. uh, at the ground uh and then when you get into the detail of that, you know, tell me more about what was going on. You, you find this whole context to that. Um, and time and time again, uh, I, I was some, this is before Solution Focused, I would ask, so if you hadn't done that, what might have happened? Oh, I threw it at the teacher. Oh, you didn't throw it at the teacher. <laughs> That's 
sort of felt like, obviously, I saw what you felt, what I felt like doing that, yeah, but you did it you threw it at the floor. And uh, we know in solution focus, that's really a fascinating bit of information, isn't it? So, you know, yeah, yeah. subsequently, I learned to ask, so how come you don't throw it at the mm. yeah. You know, yeah. You hear this great kind of picture of, like, well, I wouldn't do that, I wouldn't do that. Teachers, oh, no, I don't, I don't I want a woman, you know, oh, all right, oh, okay. And so it unfolds. And, and how did you stop yourself? Uh, well, I, I just had to kind of I kind of stopped myself completely. That's why I threw it through it at the floor. Um, mm. But I, I, I threw it away. <laughs> That's why I hit the floor. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and I think family therapy, it kind of gave me this system to believe that ah, it, it's, I hope at least it's a respectful belief that when people are dealing with what's going on in their lives, it's mm. in the context. And make it, people are making the choices that are open to them. They make the best chance, best choice they can out of the available options. Mm. You know, frankly, I'm not thinking that's probably the human condition. You know, and uh, you know, everyone is is within their own reality and does the best they can within that. So family yeah. therapy. So that that, uh, that was around for um, in Sue. You know, as, as she starts working there, uh, Steve joins them. Um, I do remember because that that time they were meeting up the early seventies. There was a, a lot of initiatives of people getting very fascinated by family therapy and grouping together. So, um, and there was a thing they did where they watched each other's practice. Now, again, if you think about the world of therapy at the time, actually that's pretty unusual. Even in social work, it was unusual. And again, mm. diverting onto my own training, I remember we did a thing that's called a process recording. Uh, which instead of just writing up, you know, the session, you wrote up this more detailed account of what had happened in, in the conversation, you know. Um, but you can't get away from the fact that it's all from my head, mm. you know. And uh, I know you, you've done one of these conversations with uh, uh, with Guy, Guy Shannon before. Um, both of us were very influenced by a book that was around in our social work training called As a Client Speaks, which is mm. uh, where I know Tim, so... Um, social workers are asked to give an account of what they've done with families. Families are asked to give an account of the work the social workers have done with them. And there's hardly any correspondence. It's mm. like totally different stories about what went on. And it's just really alarming, you know? So yeah, even yeah. the process recordings, you know, there's something of a construction in the practitioner's head, you know, when that's done. But videoing, which is what they were doing in, in Milwaukee. And I, as a trainee family therapist, was learning to do, actually seeing what, what's actually going on between you and people. It's really quite an eye opener. Yeah, uh, I yeah. tell you, John, since, since, since the lockdown, we've obviously been um, recording our Zoom conversations with families. Yeah. And it's very interesting watching them back and mm. reflecting and saying, why did, I, why did I ask that? Why did I not pick up on that? Why was I not curious about this? Yeah, yeah, and it's it's very very interesting, kind of looking at not that the family, but looking at our own practice and oh, how yeah, we yeah, can yeah. improve it. Yeah, absolutely. And so that that's actually a key thing that we, you know we're talking about the evolution of solution focus. So this sort of faith, you know, the uh, family therapy at its most simplest, you know, kind of into the world, if you like, um, you know, that starts to lay the groundwork. Uh, you, you've got watching practice that lays the groundwork. You see what you're actually doing, you know, and you mm. see what is helpful. You see what doesn't seem to do anything, and or even doesn't help, you know. So that's really, really good feedback, you know. Uh, you can get better at the stuff that's helpful. Of course, you, know, you bring Steve onto the uh, scene, Steve Deshays, and that then gives us a link to Milton Erickson uh, because Steve Deshays was was fascinated in the world of therapy. Um, I, I've heard it said that. He asked, well, who's written a good book on therapy? Who should I read about? And he was told about a, a book uh, that, that Jay, Haley, Jay Haley had published uh, about the work of Milton Erickson, so Uncommon Therapy, uh, which I've got. So I'd also read that, you know. Uh, and, and it's something about Milton Erickson. And I, on, on our course, um, you know, there's always a bit of a peril when people do the history of solution focus because sometimes they get rather too fascinated in Milton Erickson forget to talk about mm. Steve Rinson. Yes, Joe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know that feeling. Yeah. I, 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 took a, I'm, I, I made a point of um, because so much that, that could be taken from Milton Erickson but uh, there's two things in particular I think I, I, I want to bring into this conversation. One is 
we seem to carry a faith that change is always possible. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it, it, it's been written, Steve wrote about how he tried to sort of um, work out the logic of, of what Ericsson was doing and created different piles of what he did in different situations and eventually gave up because it, it's just different. <laughs> and um, if, you, if you heard about the metaphor of the Procrustean bed, the Procrustean bed, does that ring a bell? No. No. Okay. Not for me. Oh, I just telling. So it comes, it's a Greek legend. So King Procrustes. So the thing is, if you were kind of stranded and uh, you came to his castle, uh, he he would put you up for the night. Um, unfortunately, he would lock the door. Um, uh, he would give you a bed, but unfortunately, there was a condition that came with the bed, which was that if you were too long, you'd have a bit chopped off, so you fitted. If you were too short, he would stretch you, so you fitted. So it's not the best place to stay. And, and, and Erickson's view as a psychiatrist was that a, a lot of mental health practice, a lot of therapy approaches seem to be like that. The yeah. point was fitted into the model. So yeah, yeah. In bed. and that's why it's so difficult to kind of, you know, make an overall sense or theory for like of Erickson's work because he seemed to be so different each time with this client he kind of does that, with this client he does that. And again, that's a clue to solution focus that for us to work in a way uh, that um, um, creates a conversation around that client, where they are, this family, that family, where they are, what's going on now, what they want to have better in the future. Uh, and is that is absolutely unique to them. Uh, and so each time it's different, you know. Um, so that, so that's, there's so much you could take from Ericsson, I think. But uh, kind of he, he uh, certainly um, is one of those shoulders. I think that um, you know people have stood on, uh, you know, uh, shoulders of giants, if you like. And um, uh, and also the kind of notion that the, the intervention doesn't necessarily have to take a long time. That sort of yeah. that. Uh, Frequent enough, I, and that kind of resonated for me because I, I always had a kind of lingering sense that there's going to be something important about how we begin, um, and and I, I, you know, I still give a lot of thought to well, what's my first question going to be, because that's going to shape it, uh, whatever that first question is. Um, if I can just sort of give you a quick diversion here. Um, uh, I left Palms in uh, 2010 and, and I've been working in private practice since then. Um, one of the fascinating pieces of work I've had a chance to do is, is what uh, is called Resolutions Work, developed by, uh, well, the book is written by Susie Essex and uh, Andrew Tunnell. So situations where um, typically parents have had uh, a, a child removed uh, or, and maybe another child has been born, that child's been removed. Uh, but there's some sort of possibility that if work could be done with a family, it just might be possible uh, for the child to be returned. Uh, so it's, it's, so I had this marvellous opportunity over the last few years to do with a few families using this particular approach. Um, um, and uh, it, it it, it creates a kind of, you know, safety team around the family, so the parents have to choose people. They're going to have their safety team, uh, so you get a mixture of people, from parents, sometimes next door neighbours, sometimes best friend will work, so whoever you know they kind of bring forward. Say, well, this is our team. They're going to help us keep our child safe. Um, you'd have the key professionals, uh, so the social worker who's carrying you know the responsibility. Uh, of the welfare and safety of the child and looking out for that uh, guardian ad litem. Um, and my first meeting was often with all of those people, so about a dozen people or so. Um, and uh, I mean, it's no exaggeration. <laughs> so I, I sometimes spend part of an hour kind of working out, well, what's my first question going to be? Because mm. with a grouping like that, so much is going to come from that what can evolve. So, yeah, so going back to Moen Erickson, there's something about him. He seemed to be really just very good at, you know, getting off to uh, a finely tuned start with this particular person he's with now, you know. Uh, and I think that, that made the work all the quicker, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so and the other thing just add into this, um, you know, uh, Mental Research Institute, that was another bunch of people, uh, John Weakland and others, who were part of this kind of fascination you know, that was a bubbling up in the world of family therapy about, well, let's look at our work together, let's learn from the sessions. Uh, so they were certainly very influential. 
Um, and I think they shared something with um, uh, Ericsson in, in that the interest was in the present uh, and the future. Oops, you okay there? Yeah. And uh, bear in mind that, you know, therapy up until that point was doing a lot of going into the past. Um, and so that if people need to talk about the past, fair enough. But uh, but to insist on you know, kind of uh, what was oh, the one time better. Okay. Sorry, can you go back to if people insist on talking about the past? Yeah, yeah if people need to talk about the past, it's harder than, you know, if they trust you, yeah, fair enough. Um, but, but if it's their idea, you know, that well, you're going to have to talk, uh, you know, about you know all that's going to lead up to this and all of that, you know. Um, it's another procrastinating bed, in a sense, you know. Uh, this is why, the way we help people here. So, you know, you're going to have to do it sort of thing, you know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And um, the, um, what were you saying earlier about, um, because because he was so unique and if, and obviously every family that we meet is unique. Yeah. So, you know, um, whether it's depression, anxiety, um, it's almost like how does that individual do depression or anxiety? Because exactly. I need to know that. I need to know that information. I can't just assume um, from the label that I know what someone's going through. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll cut across you there. You were going to say? No, no, no. I was, I was just, uh, I was struggling to hear you, John. Go on. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me what that reminds me of. Um, because for a long time, there's been a thing called the solution focus list. Um, I think we were very lucky that the uh, internet came into being <laughs> when it did, mm. because it meant that people who are passionate about solution focus could support, encourage, and learn from each other. You know, mm. and uh, you know when they're around, incidents they would often join in, and it's just absolutely delight, you know? it was a very regular pattern uh, I saw. Uh, she used to make me talk because someone who is new to the approach was saying, uh, well, I work with people who are depressed. How do you use solution focus with people who are depressed? And if Jays was joining in, you would nearly always say, uh, well, find out, find out what they want to have better in their life. <laughs> mm. <laughs> like, find out what they want. Because, yeah. One person wants to sleep better, another person wants their appetite better, as you know, you know, so what yeah. is it the person wants more of? You know? yeah. yeah. And that's what always, um, when me and Aisha are working with families where you assume that they want, the first thing they want is the violence to end. Mm. Uh, but often they might say, I want to understand my son better. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, you go with that because... Um, once that once that happens and once that communication is is starting to build um the violence kind of takes care of itself in a way it does and i i think people who are kind of unsure about solution focus you know might doubt that you might find that mm. somewhat hard to believe but time and time again that is that's been my experience most certainly uh mm. you know for people to for people to make the changes that are important to them other things inevitably have to fall in the place and have to be different yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and and uh sometimes they can be such small changes we're not looking for uh although we use the miracle question a lot mm -hmm. or you know uh, whichever way people want to phrase it um we are looking at small manageable steps yeah yeah i think we are and uh, i mean time to get i mean yeah there's so much in solution focus that you know fascinates me and that i'm kind of keen to share with people sometimes i'm you know i'm i left sure you know what you know what are the most important bits and what you know shouldn't i miss out yeah um mm. but to say that that business is small change, small doable change seems to be really really important um mm. i think when you're scaling questions kind of is i think you know you know if 10 you know is the, you know the best hope so, you know the place people you know the person wants to get to and you ask where they are um mm -hmm. and they're saying three you know um when people are not used to solution focused you know i mean it's important that we share that well first we ask how come it's three and not lower because that's extremely mm -hmm. important um but the point i want to make here this is probably the person thinking three is a heck of a long way away from ten mm -hmm. you know uh 
which is why when we don't ask, well, what's going to get you to 10? Because that's just enormous and maybe why it's been so difficult to change anyway. And we ask, mm -hmm. well, you know, if you were at four, how would that be different? Um, mm -hmm. uh, with sometimes with young people I, or children, I, I, you know, I say, well, if, if you could have made a little bit of, effort, of an effort here, you know, um, doing something in particular you, you think might make things better, you're at three, where do you think you could get to? Um, and so they'll come up with their own number, you know, and you know, working in Calvin is just absolutely delight working with younger children, you know, because they're doing decimals and, you're like, you know, 3.2 and that's like in front and you've got three and a quarter, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, yes, sometimes, uh, it, you know, the, even the numbers you use isn't really that important. It's just mm. showing a progression. It could be percentages. It could be, you know, anything. One, one to a hundred, one to a million. Um, yeah, and, and I've had uh, young people say three point two five, or you know, and it doesn't. Yeah. The number is 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 relevant, but in the sense that it doesn't matter which number you use. Oh, no. And um, I think that oh, you know, again, going off on a bit of a tangent here. So. Um, uh, so I first came across Solution Focus 1991, and I think brief. Um, Sorry, John, you're going to have to repeat that. 1991. Yeah, 1991. And the guys in brief and others who were working with them must have been it for a couple of years, you know. Um, mm. So, I mean, I used to say this, you know, this approach is the new kid on the block. Well, absolutely, you can't say that anymore. <laughs> it's been around for quite a while, you know. Um, um, and in some services, they've actually got it, you know, in their assessment uh, schedules and so on. But yeah. it's like sometimes the magic has drifted away from the tools. <laughs> and so sometimes people, um, I remember doing training with a service once, and I was saying, you're familiar with, with scaling questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, we use them all the time. Oh, they're quite mm. boring. I said, boy, are you really boring what, what, what you did with them? You know? <laughs> well, you know, with the number, um, we write it down, you know, and say, so what you got to do to get a six then, you know, and uh, mm. people don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's boring. <laughs> You're not doing it right, you know. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things being missed out here. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that's all. And I, I, I mean, there's a point I would want to kind of stress here that, you know, you're, you're drawing attention to here for me. Uh, Joe, is that the, the small changes? This is one of these uh, links back to early days of family therapy. You've got um, Gregory Bateson. This the phrase he came up with: "A difference that makes a difference." Mm. Uh, so, so a lot of family therapies therapists can quote that. They'll have assignments they've written that they quote this, this thing. You know, a difference that makes a difference. Um, and that critically, I think, is, is what's going on when. Someone says, oh, I'm, you know, I'm at three and a half, I was at three and a half. Uh, this would be happening. Uh, I, I've had the privilege of su supervising a lot of uh, practitioners over the years. And uh, one practitioner was saying how uh, a woman who'd been very depressed and made a lot of progress put together about, well, what was the kind of turning point? And the woman said, is when I, when I painted me toenails, when I painted me toenails. <laughs> Yeah. Which may well have come out of the miracle question. What would be the first mm -hmm. sign the miracle had happened? Well, I, yeah. I feel like painting my toenails and suppose you did what might happen. And I've shared this a lot in training with people. And, you know, most people get it and think, yeah, that mm. could be a turning point. That could be a profound so, difference that makes a difference. Yeah. You've just touched on the point with your training, John. So what are you up to these days? Mm. Um... Well, less training, um, training when I'm asked. It's, it's mainly, you know, uh, running the, you know, solution focused trainers, so doing training through that. And, um, yeah, supporting the likes of Tara and Naomi uh, and Stefan to be doing that training themselves. So that that's mm. taking up uh, time, <laughs> yeah, mm. but in a delightful and fascinating way. So that, that's, mm. that's certainly what I'm up to. Um, but also, you're just using solution focused in other ways, you know, because um, mm. you can pop it into other situations. We've just had a mm. um, uh, Zoom with um, friends in a walking group. Uh, so, 
we're a, a bunch of somewhat older people. <laughs> for whom the walking group has been really, really important. You know, as many as eight, 18 of us at a time. Of course, we haven't been out on a walk for two or three months now, you know. So, so we had a, we've had a virtual walk on Zoom, you know. Uh, oh. Yeah, we went into breakout rooms. We go replicate what happens on a walk. You're on your own, and suddenly there's two other people by the side of you, and you start talking. Wow. You just, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I don't know if it's because I knew we were talking, but I put a, a, a question to our group and I said, "Well, mm. yeah, just suppose you know the prime minister uh, creates an exemption for our walking group uh, and names us." Uh, where would you like to go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like the miracle question, isn't it? You know, adapted. Mm, you know, mm, yeah. yeah. And we talked about seeing the sea and all sorts of things. <laughs> so you can take this. In, so this is some kind of what I'm up to. Yeah, using this yeah. in, a, in all sorts of places. Uh, and private, private, I mean, uh, after leaving comes, uh, so I kind of launched into private practice. So you know, I see people that way. Um, yeah, which has been face to face, but obviously not at the moment, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, we we haven't actually had the privilege of um, meeting you yet, John. Physically meeting you, <laughs> no. but um, um, you know that's something that I, I know Joe and I really, really want, and we want to meet Tara. And we we're fed up of virtual hugs now. No, um, <laughs> but, but you have, um, and, and thank you to Tara as well. But you've both you've both really inspired us uh, with your knowledge and with your mentoring, um, and for that we're very thank you. And for for anyone that's kind of wants to look into solution focused training, um, uh, look up solution focused trainers. Um, they are absolutely brilliant, very very supportive. Uh, well, Joe and I are very happy with them. Yeah. Um. um but yeah, don't don't take four days to try and create a five minute PowerPoint. Is my <laughs> <laughs> it was fascinating. It was a fascinating journey, though, John. Well, it, was, it was. That's what we always hope. <laughs> uh, it it yeah, was yeah, for yeah. me, and I and I have actually the way that we work, John. I'm not going to lie. Is if if we if I receive a very long email or I have to read something that's quite long, I send it to Joe. He emails. He reads it and then he summarizes. <laughs> well, of course, we couldn't do that this time. So I was going back and I was researching on the internet and we've got loads of solution focus books here at the office. I was kind of, Joe, Joe picked out the books that I should read because, you know, he's the reader. And I started reading and then I couldn't stop. Yeah. So, and, and now I love it because when you talk about Lipchick and everyone else, I'm like, I know who that is. <laughs> Whereas oh, John, before, what, what, before then, yeah, I wouldn't have known. Sorry, go on, Joe. I was just going to ask John, for, for someone who... Um, we might be listening and thinks actually, um, I want to get into this, but I'm still not quite sure. Any any books you would recommend for a novice or someone who's just really interested in maybe taking a change of approach? Yeah, well, you know, a good friend guy. You know, it's a good place to start, guys. Book solution focus practice. He's got the new edition out, so that yeah. that's usually one I would recommend. There are so many, you know, and. Uh, the other, the other thing um, I would encourage people to have a look at the uh, the, the podcast Alfie have been doing because uh, they've you know they've done ninety nine of them now you know and uh, yeah. in, in a way when we think about the evolution of solution focus that there's something to be said about you know what ideas evolve that kind of step by step that gets to the you know the place where solution focused is it's the assumptions that uh, are there when we work with people in a solution focused way the sort of questions we might ask you know but there's something critically important i think about the how you know how it evolved I think mm. right at the beginning i was saying that whilst i'll probably talk about Stephen Insu, we must never forget there's more than in Stephen Insu. i don't know if it necessarily would have come about if it was only Stephen Insu. you never know maybe it would have but but there was a bunch of other people uh, so the something, and you know, you you mentioned how you meet up with, with practitioners on a regular basis, and and you talk about the practice together. That's so very very important. And I think yeah. Alfie and Dominic have done a really really important job for the whole you know community of people who are passionate about solution focus, but also for people who are kind of new to it and curious about it, because um, yeah. there are just so many perspectives there, and there are. There'll be a lot of that uh, overlap. There'll be probably a fair bit of repetition, people saying the same things, but also difference, you know. Um, and so 
Uh, there, there's something else that I was keen to sort of mention this afternoon that, you know, it, it's important to the evolution of the approach. And if it's important to the evolution, it's also important about uh, to keep it alive and fresh, you know, to uh, keep it keep it what it can be, you know. Uh, so lots of perspectives. Uh, and, and I know you're doing similar things, you know, you, you mentioned before we started about, you know, bringing in sort of guest speakers and so on, you know. Mm. And that, that, that's absolutely the way to go. No, I already say the same things. <laughs> well, we we now. Oh, I can't hear you. John, don't be jealous. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Sounds gone. Can you hear me? I don't know. Me you. moving makes a difference. Okay. Yeah, I got you now. Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you now. I, I was going to say, don't be jealous. <laughs> don't be jealous. But we've actually got a um, a date night with Gil Green next week. Oh wow! <laughs> and we're yeah. going to be watching um, Steve Deshays' videos. Oh, well done, well done. Yeah. Oh, there's so much to learn. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he, and it's been incredible how many people we've met, and it's it's he's you know he's he's brilliant, and he's been telling us about you know how he got into SF, but he's got a bank of videos, John. Well, 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 well you you found a treasure trove. So I there, think I think you? we all. Need we all need to jump on the plane when we can and go to Gil's house. <laughs> and the, the other thing that we found, um, just like you, you today, the, the the community is so giving and so willing to to give up time and effort and share what they know. Yeah, oh, that's always been my experience. That, that's why I've loved going to gatherings as traditional focus practitioners. And uh, you know, I, I always. So we've got a UK association, so you know people would find that there when you know the annual conference. Uh, but European Brief Therapy Association, you know, has just been really, really important to me over the years. There's such generosity and sharing, yeah. You know, and you could be sitting next to someone, and uh, uh, they've got you talking about something really fascinating. And you know, this has happened to me, and I've spoken at great length. And then, you know, and I, oh, who are you, by the way? And it turns out to be someone who's written dozens of books. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Curious, and it, it is incredible. I think jo, Joe and I need to start exploring writing a book, don't we, Joe? We must, oh, must, must. Yeah. The more, you, more we get out there, the better. Yeah. Well, Gil's asked us to write a paper, hasn't he? Well done. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of winking. John thinks I'm winking at you, but I'm winking at John. Let's write a book. Let's write a book, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I've been a great enthusiast for people getting things written. You know, and yeah, you know, over the years I've written stuff myself. You know, and um, uh, I got onto a bit of a role of kind of writing stuff. You know? And uh, uh, yeah, and I'm really, I would absolutely encourage others to do it wise because it, there's so much interesting work going on and so much mm. of the story. Of, uh, of this approach and the difference it can make in people's lives, you know, it really, really needs to be out there because uh, that's the stuff that fascinates people, you know. Um, so, John, yeah. as, as you've had, you've met such uh, wonderful people from the SF world yourself. <laughs> if if I was to ask you, what's because I often I often go to training and I listen to people and I think, wow, that's a great question. I'm nicking that one. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that one in the bank. You know, uh, what's what would be your top five solution-focused questions that you always think when you heard it, you thought that's brilliant. Uh, oh, thank you. Because <laughs> we might, we might get a list going, John. You can be the first contributor to this list. Okay, so five, five. <laughs> well, I can talk about the five that typically come out of my mouth anyway. Mm -hmm. Um. Um, what you, one is uh, what are you hoping might change for the better as a result of us meeting up today? Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that Joe's writing this down? Yeah, fair oh, enough. I thought you was writing it down. We've got to get a list together, love. Right, what were you <laughs> what? He's proper writing this down. What were you yeah. hoping? What was the question, John? What were what you hoping would, could, could change for the better? Yeah. Like as it. a result of us meeting today yeah the one would be um 
what do you hope could even be a little better by the time we finish talking? Yeah. 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 Uh, obviously, you know, Bruce just hopes from the conversation that that's in the mix, you know. Mm. You know, so that that's sometimes there in, in the list of five, you know. Um, yeah. uh, what else? Uh very often when it you know someone tells me very very clear, clear, clearly that it wasn't their idea to come you know i hear whose idea it was i said so what how would so and so be able to tell that, that mm. we'd had a useful conversation, we'd had a useful conversation. yeah mm. so that's a really important one um uh so that's certainly there i'm up to four you know <laughs> <laughs> um uh so, sometimes usually those are enough uh, sometimes, I mean, one I'd have up my, my sleeve is that, um, suppose six months from now, um, things are m m much better, much, much better. Um, uh, when you're looking back on the time when we first met, um, what would you remember as the kind of starting point for moving on? Yeah, Something yeah, like yeah. that. You know? That's all, that light bulb moment. It. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't have to write this down, Ash. We, this is we, this is yeah, recorded, right? Yeah, well, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know. There's another question which uh, you know I must add into this. This from Playman Panatov in in Bulgaria, which is which is this. Um, what would be a good question for me to start off with? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of as you get Playman's point, that, you know, if we trust the client, if we trust. The client, yeah. Ask them to you know, tell us what question to start with, and then ask. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for that tip. I shall ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think that's very important. That is that is very important. Um, mm. And we do that sometimes. It is it's very empowering for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it kind of helps you not lose focus, just in case you are. We yeah. have actually run out of time, guys. Okay. Um. John, you know you're a superstar. I don't need to tell you you're a superstar. You are a superstar. Oh, I don't mind you saying it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Joe and I are always very, very grateful because um, everyone that we invite on here is there are mentors, there are people we look up to, there are people we're learning from. Um, we can always keep learning. Change okay. is in inevitable, as as we yeah, know. Yeah, so absolutely. we've got to kind of move with it. Yeah. Um, but I have definitely enjoyed this time. Yeah. Joseph, you. would you like yeah. to say something? Uh, yeah, John, thank you for giving up your time today. It was really, and I, I, when we first met you over the training, it kind of, you know, when you feel like that enthusiasm just comes through. And I think uh, it's, uh, it's really lovely talking to you. And thank you for your six questions. <laughs> You're very welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you for your questions. No, you're brilliant. Can I just ask you to wait there, John, while I end the, the live session? Um, but we'll say goodbye to everybody. That's uh, bye everyone. Uh, watch and that will that will watch later on. So um thank you, John. You're thank you. Welcome. Um there we go.